I want to talk to you today about what you can do to own your city. What you can do to take ownership over the future of your city and how you can, in fact, shape it. But before I do, I want to pause and take a moment to envision with you, to imagine with you what a great city looks like. Because, like me, chances are you live in a city. And chances are there's things about that city that you love. But chances are there's also things about that city that have you worried. You might be worried about your city. But let's put that worry aside for a moment and let's focus on a great city and what that great city might look like. So let's begin with your home. Imagine that you have a great place to live that's affordable and well-located, quality housing near where you work. You get to live exactly where you want to live. Your first choice is where you get to live in this great city. It's a place where you can put down roots, you can know your neighbors. In this city, you feel safe and you thrive. Imagine your neighborhood. Imagine being able to get the things that you need, good parks, maybe community gardens, good schools, places to shop, worship, get a haircut, go to the doctor, all within walking distance or a short transit ride from home. The city you are imagining might be a place where you can choose to use and consume less Less driving, less commuting, a smaller house with less stuff, as a result a smaller ecological footprint, so that you can have more. More time with your family and friends, more time in your community, more time maybe cooking or painting, or maybe more time hanging out in parks and ravines, maybe more time kibbutzing in coffee shops. Well, imagine in this same city, Imagine in this same city that it is possible to move in one generation from being a newcomer to being firmly established in the middle class. You can arrive in this city with, all, with nothing but desire and commitment and all of the infrastructure that you need to get started, like libraries and transit and education and job creation opportunities, will be at your fingertips to make it happen because all that you bring to this city we're imagining, whoever you are, will be recognized as adding value, as making the city a richer place. That city is in fact a place of innovation. That city is a place that attracts growth. It's a great place to learn. As a result, there's many opportunities in that city for creative work. You wouldn't have to move away to find a great job or because you cannot afford housing. Your children would not have to move away from the city where they were raised because they too could find a job and could find affordable housing. This city, capitalizing on the skills and the knowledge of its people, would be a place of resilience in an economic downturn. This wouldn't be a city of quick fix strategies, uh-uh. This is a city that knows itself and knows its future. Its residents would invest and live and work and play with confidence. They know what to expect from their city. Imagine this city is also a place of beauty. It's a place where design matters because the resources that we need to survive, like land and water, they're handled with care in this city. Where we invest in public buildings, in public spaces, and in our streetscapes, our squares, because we know and we value both inspiration and happiness in our everyday life in this city. The city of the future that I'm asking you to imagine is a wonderful promise, isn't it? Isn't it a wonderful possibility? See, this is the thing. Some people think we can get there. And I know we need to. This vision that I've just outlined to you, I believe, is in fact our great hope. But at times, I'm scared that we can't. 
I've questioned my belief that this vision of a city can become our reality. This vision seems so real, so possible, and many of the things, things that I've just talked about, they've been done in bits and pieces in other cities in the world, and yet at the same time, it seems in unreal, it seems impossible. Not impossible in a too-good-to-be-true kind of way, it all seems achievable. It actually seems impossible in a, I'm not sure we've got it in us kind of way. So what do I mean by this? It has become clearer and clearer to me that the changes that we need to see are only going to happen as a result of you. Now, just by showing up here today or watching a video, we, we really shouldn't kid ourselves and think that that's really doing something because it really isn't doing something. But moving forward, maybe there are things that we can do that can, in fact, change this. We can achieve this vision of a great city. It's going to be hard, in fact. It's going to be really, really hard. And we need to understand that at the outset. But people come up to me all the time, and they say to me, and this is in part because I keep talking about this wonderful vision, and people think, hey, that sounds pretty good. I think I could sign up for that. It's quite the picture. I walk into a downtown bookstore and the owner looks at me and says, what can I do to help? I get emails from realtors, whoa, love this vision of the city, what can I do to help? Developers, students, architects contacting me, what can I do to help to achieve this vision? Well, the last thing I want to do is to be walking around talking about some vision, raising expectations about a future that isn't actually ours. So I do, in fact, have a plan, a plan that can assist us in achieving this goal. It's a plan based on ideas, experiences, and observations in city building. I have sought to assess change, to identify when and where shifts in ideology and ideas have resulted in desired outcomes, and to understand instances when visions and plans have quite simply been effective and have worked. And I believe there are three critical and entwined success factors that need to lead us towards this vision of creating a great city. Now, the first one is the most important, and that's why I'm going to spend the most amount of time on it. And the first one is the need to believe. We are rewarded for being optimistic. There was a time when we believed in putting a man on the moon. Now, I've lived in my entire life knowing that we put a man on the moon. But just imagine this for a minute. Imagine some people sitting around and saying, wouldn't it be great to get a man on the moon? An absurdity. How can you get a man on the moon? An absolute absurdity. But in fact, lots of people didn't believe but the right people did believe, and figured out how to get a man on the moon. It was an era of optimism, an era of belief. There was also a time when we believed in investing in our cities. Think of the Bloor Viaduct, for example, which is an arch bridge that spans the Don Valley here in the city of Toronto, connecting the core of the city to the city on the east. But back in 1918, when that bridge was built, there was no city yet to the east. And the amazing thing about building that bridge, there was the foresight and the planning by the Commissioner of Public Works at the time, R.C. Harris, to invest, and it was a lot of money, in putting a lower deck on that bridge so that someday, when people lived on the other side of that bridge, and someday, when the city had a subway system, because it didn't have one yet, this was 1918, but someday in the future, that subway that didn't yet exist for the people who didn't yet live here would in fact have the infrastructure in place to make that a reality. It took until 1966, 48 years later, before that vision became a reality. It would not have been financially viable in 1966 to structurally rehabilitate the bridge to add the subway to it. Great vision, prerequisite. But belief is a prerequisite for proceeding boldly. 
The outcomes we see in our city are as a result of believing long before something even happens. We've been having this conversation here in the city of Toronto about investing in transit. And this is not for people who don't exist. This is for people who already do exist. We don't have to imagine the future. And I'm fond of saying, asking the question, if I told you that for 60 bucks, just 60 bucks a year, you could have a state-of-the-art public transit system, would you be willing to pay it? 60 bucks a year for a state-of-the-art public transit system. Well, I had a conversation a couple weekends ago with a friend of mine who looked at me and he said, I get it, it's just 60 bucks, state-of-the-art transit. And he said, but I just don't believe it'll ever happen. We need belief, but belief alone isn't enough. We need to combine that belief and shape that belief with understanding. When we build understanding, we increase belief. So the second critical success factor is the need to understand. Now, there's been a lot of excitement about the potential of open data, and I believe in open data. Don't want you to misunderstand me here. The idea that data should be freely available to be republished as anyone pleases. But it's important to remember that information without understanding is just information. It doesn't get us anywhere if it's just information. When we hold public engagement sessions as a municipality, it's imperative that we shape the conversations we have with residents with information and analysis and evidence. We need to use that as the basis for generating understanding. I had an experience several years ago as a consultant. I was doing a large public consultation process. We had hundreds of people divided into small groups and there was a woman sitting very quietly at her table and I thought, oh, maybe she doesn't feel comfortable to participate. So I went up to this woman at the break and I said, how are you doing? How's your session going? She said, oh, it's fascinating. I came here today to tell you what I think you should do in my city. But as I've been listening to the people around the table, I've realized there's a lot that I need to understand. So I've decided to be quiet today. I'm going to listen and to seek to understand today. We are no further ahead if we do not use our individual and collective intelligence to advance our understanding. Open data in and of itself is of limited value. Collecting input, I would argue, is of limited value as well if that input is not based on understanding. So we need to spend more time seeking to understand, which is difficult, but it's, believe, it's linked to the third critical success factor, which is the need to engage. Both belief and understanding grow through engagement. How does engagement take place? Well, it's much, much more than voting every three or four or however many years. And in fact, voting without understanding is a risk to our society. It is imperative to identify your sphere of influence and to determine how you might expand that sphere. What is it that you understand? What is it that you're seeking to understand? What are the tools that you can use to engage within your sphere? There are lots of important things you can do. You can blog, you can, you can tweet, you can write articles, you can hold kitchen table discussions. Personally, I would have loved to have lived in Paris in the 20s when salons were the rage. There's no coincidence that salons, having conversations around kitchen tables in your homes was the rage at the same time where there was a tremendous advancement in modern thought. Those two things go together. But today, one of the great jo joys of my job has been, believe it or not, this may come as a surprise, and. I may be exposing myself right now as kind of a nerdy planner. One of the great joys for me has been committee meetings. Now, okay, stick with me here. I know I just said committee meetings as being a great joy. It doesn't sound like it goes together. But people come to committee meetings to depute. They come and participate and share information and they share knowledge. Now, belief without understanding sounds a little bit like a not so compelling rant. And that happens too. There's lots of belief, no understanding. That isn't going to change the world. But when a deputation is belief with understanding, and this is often, this becomes a powerful moment in the room. The room is quiet, heads are cocked, thoughtfulness prevails, 
perspective shifts, positions are refined. These are moments when belief and understanding are expressed through meaningful engagement. These three factors that I've just outlined, belief, understanding, and engagement, they can't wait if we want to say change in our lifetimes. In fact, we're behind, we're way behind. There's an enormous consensus that we're under-investing in our cities, not realizing that vision that I outlined at the beginning of this presentation. So I'd like to leave you with two ways that you can own your city. And the first I will call an individual call to action. Because a city isn't something that happens to you. You make choices every day that shape and make your city. Think about Cabin Ta Cabbage Town. This is where 100 years ago, Irish immigrants took the only patch of land they had, their front yard yards, and planted cabbages. You can choose to live somewhere that allows you to walk to work, or you can choose to cycle, or you can choose to transit. If you care about local commerce, you can choose to show, shop locally, to buy locally within your neighborhood. Every time you make a choice, you turn the city into something of your own envisioning. The second I'll call the collective call to action. Although as individuals, we do influence our city in these incremental small steps, the biggest decisions that fundamentally shape our cities are made by us as a collective people, in those committee rooms, at council, at other levels of government. It is through our political processes that we decide whether we're going to invest in transit or not. It's through our political process that we decide whether we'll have affordable housing or affordable home ownership or lots of affordable rental in the city. These decisions are bigger than our individual actions and they shape our individual choices. They shape the choices that are available to us. Your city needs you. You need to believe in a future that is better than the past and better than the present. Your city needs you to engage, to sustain your engagement. It's not a one-shot deal. Your city needs you to seek to understand and to work collaboratively to generate and disseminate knowledge that will enhance understanding. Your city needs you. And I need you too. I need you because with this plan that I've just outlined, I really do believe. Thank you.